Good afternoon. Okay, so I'm going to give you information about what you need to know. Of just, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to graze over some of, some of the information that's after the application. The bulk of what I really want, we're in crunch time right now. We, <laughs> you know, it, it is the fourth quarter of uh, this, this first round. So I want to give as much value as I possibly can as it relates to Exhibit H. Exhibit H uh, has a 50-page limit in certain sections and uh, accounts for a net 26% of the overall points for the application. So um, not all of my slides are going to be very relevant. I'm going to kind of skip a few of them here. Um, security systems are going to be very important. I really, really want to make that super clear. It's not just the application, it's after the application. And the reason is, this is, going, this is a highly regulated industry, okay? We, we are starting in the past five or six years, we have seen more marketing for security technology direct to consumer than ever before, okay? And, and an example, if we all went trick-or-treating with our kids, this year, how many more times did we see surveillance cameras at these front doors than in years past? A lot, a lot more. There is a big, meaningful difference between what you can buy for your home front door and what you need that is ongoing regulations for your cannabis dispensary, growing facility, or infusion lab. Okay, there is a big difference, okay? Um, technologies need to integrate to each other. They uh, need to work long-term. They need to have uh, uh, long-term storage. So here are some of the technologies that you are going to have mandated. Visitor management systems. When someone comes in, you have to check them in. You have to validate their driver's license, okay? That is a database that you have to keep because part of the reporting is that you have to report to the state of Illinois what the transactions were and whom you've done business with. So visitor management systems is hugely important. Access control systems. Does anybody know what an access control system is? You got it. It's instead of a lock and key, I am using a credential, like a key fob, like a credit card looking device, or even my mobile phone. Okay, that will give me in, in and out access. All of your doors need to have egress, okay? Even the vault. I actually met uh, a security person uh, several weeks ago who put restrictions on exit of the vault. Not allowed. <laughs> you have to allow egress everywhere. Um, surveillance cameras, okay? You need to have surveillance cameras in, in pretty much every area except for the bathroom area. Um, that's point of sale. That is front door. That is vault area. That is packaging area. That is shipping receiving. That is everywhere, okay? and the level of forensic detail is also important. Um, and, that, and that system must connect to the internet securely, and it must have accessibility for law enforcement agencies to, or, or the state of Illinois to have access to. If you do not have, so everyone's heard of the word closed circuit CCTV, right? This cannot be a closed circuit CCTV. It has to be a secured IP video high resolution surveillance system that has backup redundant storage and power. You must always have 90 days of on-premise recording on your system, okay? You have to have footage, surveillance footage loca located on-prem for 90 days. Very important. Um, a lot of security systems connect to a lot of different things. So, they can affect all of your other bills, like power, HVAC, building automation, and designing the right security system that reduces this infrastructure demand is also an important variable. Um, so modern access control systems have much less power consumption, much less cost to them, and actually can be operated by a mobile phone uh, credential. So if you're an administrator, Okay, and you have an employee that you're hiring. You can literally add them to your system. You are going to have a, uh, an active directory for all of your employees of some sort. 
that directory is going to say who the employee is, what their roles, responsibilities are, and you can ultimately add them or terminate them with a click of a button on your device. Okay? So you don't have to call them in and say, hi, I need your keys. Can you please turn them in? Push a button and they have no more access. You can also open a front door for a cleaning crew or a vendor who has secured authorization through your process and procedures, also through a mobile device. Um, so that's kind of the gist of mobile access control, surveillance requirements, I've already talked about that. High resolution, you must capture pixels per foot. Forensic quality, some of it talks about, but that's math, okay? So if I mount a camera right over here, and my point of sale is right here, I need to make sure that that camera has the right focal length, has the right resolution, and the right speed, frames per second, to identify a face. So the amount of pixels per foot that you need for forensic value is 100 pixels per foot. Okay, let me get to an example here. I'm gonna kind of graze a little bit over this because I wanna get mostly to the application. This is important. There's gonna be some of your security solution with surveillance where this is okay, <laughs> believe it or not. Because if you take an image and I have a wide looking image and I zoom, it, zoom into one person's face, that's the pixels we're counting, okay? So the wider my field of view, the more that resolution is spread out between the, the, cut, the area it's covering. So if I don't have enough pixels per foot from 10 feet away to actually digitally zoom into my face, I'm gonna get something like this. But that's okay if, someone, if it's just general traffic. But if I need to get something like this, you have to make sure the focal length of the lens, the resolution of the sensor, and the frames per second are enough accuracy. And so that's part of it. Uh, here's an example. License plates. Part of the application calls for what is your external security plan? So how are you going to capture information? How are you going to audit everything? That's an important variable. Um, I'm skipping over business intelligence and marketing with security. Okay. So 150 pages is the limit. Um, there's several sections. So the first section is going to be compliance narrative. That's emergency response planning. That's how you're managing employees, how you're training employees. That's how um, it, it affects us. all areas of your operation is security. And what we implement is creating the culture of security. I have talked, talked to since March of this year and review, talked to probably in the neighborhood of 300 prospective applicants. I have reviewed north of 50 floor plans and I'm gonna give you some of my big top 10 tips of things to avoid, and I already shared one of them earlier. Don't go house hunting. <laughs> Find out what real estate per the size of your dispensary is in the, in the area that you want it to be and make sure and validate there's inventory. Doing site walks for renovation in this stage of the application is a complete waste of your time. Um, the application notes specifically, an applicant is not required to identify or secure a location before completing Exhibit J, which is the floor plan. Okay, I have seen a lot of people waste a lot of time and energy in going house hunting and saying, okay, I'll take that and I'll design my dispensary around this specific location. I've even seen people try to lock up leases. Um, don't do it. Um, find a industry standard floor plan, okay, but, but make sure that floor plan meets all of A, the security requirements from one through 19, or the, uh, the regulator requirements one through 19. Here are some of the biggest mistakes I've seen in people creating their own floor plan. Um, is that a wall exterior right here? Is this facing like outside this wall? Does anybody know? Yes. Okay, so if I have my safe, is it a good idea to have my safe room right here? No. Why? Easy access. Pretty, pretty, pretty common sense, right? You don't want to have your safe 
against any kind of conjoined wall. I have seen dozens of plans that have a safe room and a vault room that attaches to an external wall that makes it very easy for people. Number two, in the vault room, in the safe inventory room where you're going to house cash, where you're going to house inventory, the safe itself should not be attached to the perimeter wall of that area. You should have the safe inside that room. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like a square within a square. Correct. And it needs to be bolted to the ground and you also need to provide specifications of what that is um, as it relates to, in Exhibit J you do. Um, the check-in area. So that's another major issue I've seen with security floor plans is the validation of customers. This is hugely important. So your front door, you can't just let anybody walk in whenever they want, okay? You need to have a validation process. That validation process should have an intercom that has one-way, two-way, and video capability seeing whom is coming into your premises, what their purpose of coming in for is, and then they go to what's called a vestibule area. That vestibule area is where they're ultimately validated through intercom connections if they have an appointment with a consultant or if they're just shopping. And that's where you can also do your visitor management, your ID checks. And typically there is a glass proof, uh, a glass between that vestibule area and the receptionist or the security person, whomever role and responsibility. I've seen both. That's where I... So in the vestibule area, there's the front door. The front door leads to the vestibule area. Next to the vestibule area, there should be another room where a receptionist or a security guard, I've seen both kinds of designs. Either A, it's a receptionist, or B, that is in fact the security room where surveillance is monitored, IDs are checked, and people are processed in and out. Okay. So there's a there's a there's a a, a greeting or a, a, an entry area before yeah. you actually yes. start. Yes. It's called. There's, there's really three areas then before you get into the display. So so the man trap is actually that's a that's a good point. The man trap is the exit. You also don't want to have your the entrance and the exit be the same place. The man trap is what happens on the exit section, which is. Thank you for leading me to that. That is another issue. We've seen most of our plans don't have that, that we see that we have to make recommendations, either working with them or the architect. There has to be an exit for customers, an entry for customers and an exit for customers, and that is technically known as a man trap. Once they enter, exit this little area, I hesitate to call it a vestibule because it's more like a hallway, um, but it's similar in the idea where it's a process in, process out. Once they enter that area, they cannot go back in. So, but they have to, but egress is of course allowed through the exit door. So I would say, point of, outside of that, though architecturally in exhibit J, which obviously has a lot to do with exhibit H, if you have poor security process or if you don't have standard architecture uh, for your floor plan, you know, it's gonna come back to us or you know, your security people and it's gonna be rejected. And, and so, go ahead. Sorry, a question about delivery. Where exactly, how did that fall in the floor plan? Another good question. There is always a receiving door. So, so there should be an, another receiving door, usually in the back of the house, okay? I've seen, you know, I, actually three days ago, I saw a, flo a proposed floor plan that the idea was the front door was also gonna be a receiving door. Not a good, not a good idea. Your receiving door should be in the back of the house, okay, where your administrative office is, where your processing and packaging location is, where your vault and safe and inventory room and your employee break room are. That, those are all the areas where your back of the house should be located. The, you have your compliance narrative. Your compliance narrative should be in the ballpark of 25 to 30 pages. To reiterate that again, that is all of your responses to the, the sections. In addition thereof, it should include your emergency response plan, 
It should be including of your, how you're training your employees for security, your cybersecurity plan, which also I, I think is going to be an issue with a lot of people from how many people I've seen to the lack of context and detail that is written in this area. Security de IoT devices are connected to the internet. Six months ago, our federal government just banned two of the largest security camera manufacturers in the world that have ownership, uh, that are owned by the, the public regime of China. So, so the PRC owns two major Chinese camera manufacturers and they just got banned by the federal government. Okay? And so if you have security devices that are connected to the internet, you want to make sure they're secure <laughs> so, with cyber, a cyber security plan and an IoT um, uh, plan as well. There, there wasn't a ton of, I was very surprised when I read this, there wasn't a ton of demand on the applicant to provide cybersecurity plans, basic things. That should be what you, if you want extra credit brownie points, please put that in. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Are there any other extra credit brownie points that you see are not mentioned in the, um, in the regulations, but you would highly Absolutely. Yep, uh, I'm getting there for sure. So, the, the, so, so compliance narrative, 25, 30 pages. Next section. So what are the different security technologies? So you need to do a write-up on what all of these different security technologies are from surveillance to alarm, intrusion, access control. Uh, actually, a thing I left out in the very beginning is emergency response systems or emergency mass notifications. How are you going to manage an active shooter situation? How are you going to manage a robbery? How are you going to manage severe weather issues for your employees and your customers. Some do it with process procedure and training and retraining and practice. Others get assistance with technology, okay? And that's an, uh, that could be part of your plan as well. Um, the next section is your security floor plans. And we've already talked about, kind of we're bouncing around a little bit, your security floor plans basically are your security system engineering designs that go on top of Exhibit J floor plans, okay? You need to have a floor plan that well lays out where your surveillance cameras are, are installed and what they're looking at, where the cable routing is going, what the quality of image is. You need to, you need to have that floor plan laid out in every which way for surveillance. You also have to have an external surveillance floor plan. Okay, what kind of information are we, how are we securing with video surveillance our perimeter? Okay, the next floor plan is an intrusion. That's a fancy word for alarm system. Okay, how are you managing intrusion from panic alarms? Where are your panic alarms going to be mounted in your floor plan? How, where, where are they going to be positioned? How many panic alarms? Uh, what happens if there's a breach after hours of operation? How is that monitored by the third-party service provider? Um, how are you using what's called glass break sensors? Or there's also another way to do it that's uh, a film that you cover glass with that makes it less uh, impact resistant to gunshots, okay? Um, so putting sensors on windows, putting the right type of windows or film protection around your windows in, in certain areas. Um, this isn't a standard retail shop, guys. <laughs> you have, and, and this isn't because I'm telling you to. This is, they're taking in Illinois more seriously the security plan than I have seen. I have seen uh, probably about seven states of security plans. This is the most extensive that I have seen. Um, so, so floor plan, access control. You have to design the access control system, the exterior system, including your alarm. So those are all the different floor plans you need in that third section. The fourth section is uh, you must have a contract. So let's read this together. So we're very, very, very specific. So this is going to be page three, exhibit H. Okay, so we're going to skip the middle and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the top line and I'm going to read the bottom line, okay? Page limit, 50 pages, not including 
a copy of a contract with a licensed private security contractor. So the context related to that is the, is the last sentence. Provide a copy of a contract with a private security contractor licensed under section 10.5 of the private detective, comma, private alarm, comma, private security, comma, fingerprint, comma, vendor, comma, and locksmith act of 2004. So here, this was very rushed. I, I'm sure some of the people that were involved in the, the, part of this was very rushed. And so if I'm reading this and I don't know much about security, I'm probably thinking to myself, oh, okay, I just need to get uh, an agreement with a security company, right? Well, I have, I've been in security for 20 years. I have never met a locksmith that does private investigations. I have never done, seen a private investigator who installs alarms. I have never seen an alarm company that does uh, uh, fingerprint screening. And believe it or not, most security guard companies do not do fingerprints. But you need to have an individual contract with all, so this was our original interpretation of this, and then it was validated uh, when we asked questions in the first round. And I think there's another round of questions coming up here shortly, right? Yeah. So there was a 150 page um, response. And our question was, don't, shouldn't the applicant have individual licenses or contracts with individual security companies that have this core competency and meet this core license by the state of Illinois? And they said, absolutely. So what you need to do is get a license or get a agreement. So this is essentially, and please step in lawyers if, if I'm uh, overstepping in this area, you need to get an, a, a letter of intent or a letter of agreement to supply services with a locksmith that is in good standing with the state of Illinois and, and licensed by the state of Illinois, an alarm company that is also licensed by the state of Illinois, and I would double check that they're in good standing because a lot of times alarm companies and some of these service providers, eh, this quarter I'm not gonna pay my dues or I'm not gonna re-up train my, that happens all the time, okay? It's a very good question. Is that vendor list that they, they, where they'll be offering a vendor company? Who? The state. Nope. Okay. There, there, yes, you can get, you can get some, you can get some so list from the IDFR. Answer, the answer to the question, how you doing? The answer to the question, Illinois Department of Professional Regulation and those regulatory entities, they'll provide lists of the vendors that are in good standing. Oh, that's Illinois what Department of what? Well, let, let's back this up. You can go to Secretary of State's office, start there. If the corporation is not in good standing, guess what they can't be? In good standing. Wonderful. There is so, no vendor list yet. No. so that, that is true. However, <laughs> every single alarm company has different capabilities. Some don't specialize in high risk cash retail. Some only specialize in certain amount of businesses. Others, locksmiths, won't have the capabilities to do this kind of safing locks uh, or, or egress requirements that your system has. Could you get a vendor list? Absolutely. But I'm telling you, you're going to spend time in vetting some of these companies at all. If you want a question list to, an to ask some of these companies, I'm more than happy to provide that. Yes, back and all the way in the back. Before we get to that question, so we're all learning as we go along. So we just made an executive decision. Because these, this criteria is so specific, my new partner here and I, <laughs> we are going to make every effort to put together a list to consider. Can I tell you something? Sense? Yes. I've already done it. <laughs> Not, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yes and no. Our time is limited. We still have a lot of information to get through. Yep. That's why you have an email address to ask questions up. So some of these things we're going to provide and respond via email. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You were in the middle of talking about you need to get a letter of intent from locksmith. To supply services conditional on you receiving your license. So are you saying that every one of these areas you need to get a specific That is one hundred percent my recommendation because uh, that's why we asked the question the way that we did. Because the way it reads, 
leaves it up to in misinterpretation, in my opinion. And I, you know, you can call this extra credit, whatever you want. I'm calling it covering all, all areas to make sure that you're, you're doing it right. And I believe, from my research, from my asking questions in the state, that is the right way, is to A, validate that they're in good standing with the state of Illinois, that they're licensed, that they also have experience and capabilities to do the services that you need in every single security category. Yes, all the way in the back. Are you just on mobile? I am. So is your company compliant? <laughs> so we are a security consulting firm. So we are a security consulting firm. We do not do fingerprint readers. We do not do background checks. We engineer systems. We project manage security infrastructure. And we make technology uh, regula uh, recommendations. So in the state of Illinois, actually four out of the five things in the state of Illinois, you don't need a license for in other states. But in the state of Illinois, you do. Believe it or not, if you go across the border in Indiana, you do not need a license for installing alarms or locksmiths, believe it or not. Um, but we are a security engineering and consulting firm, and uh, it's our responsibility to understand best practices, technology, cost, and everything in between. So, yes? Um, what are some of your recommendations for specific security technology? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that, com that question in combination with a previous question, which I haven't gotten to is how much does this kind of system cost after you get your conditional license, after you get your actual license, okay? So the answer is uh, not as specific as I'm sure you all really want to know. So until you have a floor plan that outlines every single room, the square footage, and you design the infrastructure, you, you are not going to know how many cameras, how many cable pulls, how many alarm sensors, how many glass break sensors, how many access control panels, how many access control readers, how many locks. List goes on and on and on, right? And so the amount of cameras and resolutions and frame rates dictates how much the cost of storage server is going to be. And then there's labor. Is it going to be union labor in the city of Chicago? Is it going to be non-union labor in other starts in that area? So there's a lot that goes into it. So, so with that being said, from what I've seen in this state, uh, the first medical dispensary I did uh, was mm, about five minute drive from here on the south side called Mission, okay? And um, that was actually in 2016, and believe it or not, maybe this is a, conversa or a story for another time, there was a lot of challenges in the construction process from aldermen to certain areas. And, and, and I also think 2016, flash forward to 2020, there's much more education and awareness and, and it's not a, as much of a combative thing um, politically. But to answer the question, it's anywhere from fifty to $150,000 all in, okay? That's the best I can do off the cuff without seeing a floor plan, without seeing anything else. So that's project management, that's low voltage, that's all of the hardware, software, apps, everything. That's not the actual vault, though. That's not including the vault. That's what you would do to all of your security technology infrastructure, te security technology infrastructure, fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars all in, not including required maintenance service ongoing, because you are going to get checked once you have your dispensary opened. If you are not ha in compliance with storage and regulations, you are going to get fined and potential for. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to pan out with, with legal, but I've seen medical marijuana dispensaries in this state get fined for not being in regulation, and it compounds. I don't remember if it's daily or weekly, but if you don't get it fixed, is it daily? I'm not sure, but.